the one lecture. Thank you very much. Okay, so the goal of today's lecture is give a sketch of the proof of the Kuznetsov formula. And this is really the, uh, I, when people talk about clustermania, I think clustermania just means applications of the Kuznetsov trace formula. So this is the main technical piece in the whole course today. So uh, I, I'll spend about the first half an hour actually talking about the Peterson trace formula, which uh, I introduced in the first lecture, because I think all of the ideas already for the proof of uh, the Kuznetsov formula are already there in the Peterson trace formula, and the situation is um, a little simpler there. Okay, so uh, to recall from last time, so recall we wrote S K Q chi for the uh, uh, space of classical holomorphic modular forms. for the congruence subgroup gamma naught of Q, uh, central character chi and weight K. Uh, I guess we'll always do K at least two. So in particular, this is a finite dimensional complex vector space, so that makes our life a lot easier when just doing the Peterson formula. Um, Okay, so for any uh, modular form, uh, it admits a Fourier expansion so it's f of z, and I'll write the Fourier coefficients a f of n, and to say it's a, um, oh, I should have said cuspidal also, right? So s is typically the cuspidal subspace, so I should add that word, holomorphic modular cuspidal, I'll just write cuspidal here. And so cuspidal means that the first Fourier coefficient here, or the zeroth Fourier coefficient is going to vanish. So, um, okay, so let me recall what we're, our aim is, Peterson formula. So if B K Q chi, is an orthonormal basis for S K Q chi, then uh, there's some normalization but then it's going to give us this sum of Fourier coefficients over the orthonormal basis. And I probably haven't left myself quite enough room. Uh, <laughs> but this is going to be equal to something I'm going to write on the next blackboard. Sorry, what's too small? Margin is, oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so this is equal to uh, the indicator function of n being equal to m uh, plus 2 pi i to the minus weight sum over positive c, which are uh, divisible by q of this clustermian sum against a j Bessel function. So we need a few ingredients. So uh, one of them is, so uh, 
The way we're going to prove this is using certain modular forms in the space called Poincaré series. So if I, one way to introduce these is that um, if I take the mth Fourier coefficient of f, this is actually, this is a, this is a linear function. So for m fixed, for each m, this is a linear function on my space of modular forms. So uh, there exists a form which we'll call PM. such that uh, this linear function is given by inner product against PM. So that's not very surprising, but maybe what's surprising is that we can actually give a very explicit concrete formula for this PM, and this PM is what's called a Poincaré series. Um, so can give explicit uh, Yeah, absolutely. So uh, the inner product depends on the weight of k. And if I have f against g, it's going to be the integral uh, over uh, h mod gamma naught of q. So it looks just like the standard uh, L2 inner product, but it has an extra factor of y to the k. And this is the, the Haar measure on H mod gamma naught of Q. Okay, so um, I've already talked about gamma naught of Q, but I to say just to be uh, completely precise in this lecture, we'll actually take gamma naught of Q uh, to be the matrices A, B, C, D in S, L, 2, Z, such that C is 0 mod Q. But actually, I'm going to mod out by plus or minus the identity matrix. And I'll still write elements of gamma naught of Q as, as matrices, even though I always mean plus or minus that matrix, because plus or minus the identity is going to act uh, trivially on the upper half plane, okay? So, um, a fundamental domain for uh, H mod gamma naught of Q. Uh, okay. What, might look like something like this, where this is the upper half plane. Um, so a, a fu such a fundamental domain, maybe we'll call it F, uh, touches the boundary of the upper half plane at finitely many points. And we call these cusps. So this has three cusps here, here, and also the cusp at infinity. Um, so I'm going to let gamma infinity inside gamma naught of Q be the stabilizer of uh, the cusp infinity. And this can actually be Okay, so in this particular case, we have uh, a very explicit expression for what this gamma naught, sorry, the gamma infinity is. So gamma infinity is just these 
upper Unicode and fix too. Okay, so then the mth, uh, I guess, holomorphic Poincaré series at the cusp infinity is given by the following expression. So I'm going to sum over gamma running through gamma naught of q mod gamma infinity. And then I'm going to take chi gamma bar e of m gamma z over cp plus d to the k. Okay, so maybe we can check that if uh, k is strictly bigger than two, then bmz converges on uh, compact subsets of the upper half plane, uh, absolutely and uniformly. So uh, the pr and the proof I'm going to give it actually works when the weight is strictly bigger than two, but the, the Peterson formula here is still valid by a different, a modified proof in, in the case k equals the two. Or, so uh, we'll you have this, we'll assume in this lecture k is strictly bigger than two, but this can all be made to work for k equals two also. Um, okay, and it's also easy to check by just changing variables on the sum that uh, this p m of gamma z is chi of gamma c z plus d to the k uh, So uh, here, chi was, it was a Dirichlet character, so I should say that uh, chi of gamma chi is chi of a matrix, which we take to be chi of uh, the lower right entry. Okay, so. Okay, so there's. I should also check that it has a, uh, it's holomorphic into the cusps, or actually vanishing into all the cusps of this fundamental domain here. Um, but I've at least checked that it's holomorphic in H and that it satisfies the right transformation property. So you will probably believe that this is actually living in uh, the, the space of modular forms. And we'll check in the course of the proof of the Peterson formula that in fact it's vanishing into each of the cusps. So, okay. So then it's a sh short, nice computation to show that this Poincaré series actually satisfies the, the property here, which I said is why we care about it. Um, and so this, is something known as the unfolding technique. So we compute, so maybe I'll say let F be in SK uh, Q chi, compute F against PM by the unfolding technique. So by definition, this is H mod gamma naught of Q of F of Z sum over the definition chi of gamma bar E of minus M gamma Z bar over CZ plus D K bar 
y to k d x d y y squared. Okay. So of course you see uh, here. This is just. We're going to unfold each of these fundamental domains because we're actually summing over a set of representatives for each of the fundamental domains. Uh, so this, maybe I should say also, uh, note if I, if I let J of gamma Z equal CZ plus D or uh, gamma, I guess, in SL2 Z gamma equals ACD and uh, ZZ is in the upper half plane. So then this J uh, satisfies what looks like a co-cycle condition, gamma one, gamma two, Z. So using this, that helps us do this unfolding to cancel the right factors here. So that gives me that this, okay, this is on arrow, is equal to integral over h mod gamma infinity now of f of z e to the minus mz bar y to the k. over y squared. Okay, and now I can just write this uh, as an iterated integral and use the Fourier series expansion. So here, uh, I guess this is equal to just integral zero to one uh, and zero to infinity. Okay, so then if you write these in terms of their x and y parts, you get the indicator function of m being exactly equal to m. So this comes out to be exactly, uh, and you can see that the gamma function will turn up here from these exponentials and the k, exactly gamma to the k minus one of a uh, over four pi m to the k minus one a f. Okay, so up to this factor, this inner product really does pick out the M Fourier coefficient. Okay. Now, on the other hand, as, as Valentin said uh, last, during the previous lecture, what Peterson really did was he computed the Fourier expansion of the Poincaré series. So that's what we're going to do next. And okay, it's you get a very nice expression, and it looks like the right-hand side of the Peterson formula over there. So maybe I'll do this in a little bit more generality than just exactly this one Peterson or this one Poincaré series, because that'll be useful for us uh, later. We won't have to redo work when we go to the Kuznetsov formula. So here's uh, just a kind of slightly more general version of this Poincaré series. This is maybe called an incomplete Poincaré series. So um, I'm gonna let f of z be a function on the upper half plane. Such that 
this Poincaré series converges. f is a function on h such that this converges. So of course, if I let f be a complex exponential, I get recover the Poincaré series I had before. And so we can compute the Fourier expansion of this incomplete Poincaré series really nicely. So maybe the first step where you can already see the shape of the Peterson formula coming out is the following little exercise. So I can, I have the following uh, expression for gamma naught of Q. So I take these uh, upper triangular matrices with ones on the diagonal, um, union over C bigger than zero, C exponent to zero mod Q, union over d mod c relatively prime to c of gamma infinity a b c d gamma is infinity um, so where uh, here for each c and d inside the inner unions um, I can pick one choice of a and b pick any a b such that a, this is a matrix of determinant one, so a, b minus. Doesn't matter which a and b I pick, but uh, okay. So the exercise isn't hard, uh, but it's sort of impossible to explain very succinctly at a blackboard, but if you just write these explicitly over an m and an n and just multiply this out and stare at it, you'll see that this is true pretty directly. There's no, there's kind of nothing deep in this. But already you can see you have the sum over C, which is zero mod Q, and you can already see this is going to lead us to a, uh, a Klusterman sum. Okay, so then we can just use this to expand this sum. So this P, F, M of Z is going to be, um, okay, maybe before I expand the sum, let me do, add one more hypothesis actually. So, okay, let me assume uh, that this function F, which I haven't, we haven't chosen whatsoever up to this point, satisfies the following Transformation rule, z plus t uh, is going to be equal to f of z, e of t for any real number t. Okay, so z can be complex, but, but t has to be real. Um, and I can always write gamma of z, a z plus b over c z plus d. So can actually just write this in the following way, cz plus d. So under this hypothesis on f, f of uh, m gamma z, which is uh, comes up here, right, is actually going to be e of m a over c, f of minus m z over c, c, z plus d. Okay, and then just, now I'm going to expand that sum using this decomposition for gamma naught of q. And what am I gonna get? I'm gonna get p, f, m of z is f, mz for this first term 
plus sum over c zero mod q sum over d relatively prime to c. So that is for the second gamma infinity here. Um, and then I have a gamma of d bar e of m a over c from this f minus m z c. over z plus c m d c k. OK, so here uh, you'll notice I have c z plus d plus c n also. So the that comes from, if you just write out that matrix multiplication, that's what you get. OK? Okay, so here I've got this sum over z, and this is something smooth, so this is just screaming out for plus on summation. So this interior sum over z from the Fluvius backboard, I'll just write, uh, okay, well, I want to pull out those two factors that have nothing to do with n, right? So maybe I'll actually write it. Okay, just recopying this from the Fluvius backboard. So and maybe uh, if I also do a change of variable along the way, what am I going to get? I'm going to get uh, maybe an integral over the imaginary part of w is equal to the imaginary part of z, f of uh, minus m over c squared w, e of minus m w w over c w to k and then there's e of n z plus n d over c that pops out from the change of variable okay so just putting this back into the previous expression what do we get we get that p m f of z comes out to be f of mz uh, plus summing over m and all of z, summing over all the d mod c star chi bar of d e of m a plus m d over c. I guess that whole thing over C. Okay, and then some integral transform. Uh, okay, and then maybe I'll also write an E of N Z here. So this here is, of course, just the Klusterman sum, the chi Klusterman sum coming out. So I think maybe one of the remarks I just want to make. Uh, so note that the S chi M N C uh, already appears, and we haven't even picked the the F at all. Okay. 
uh, this expansion, uh, even though we haven't picked up. So I guess this really says that these Klusterman sums are coming from something that's just arithmetic and is not is not analytic. Uh, yeah, I'm missing a summation over C. Thanks. Um, so it should go it should go here. I can shrink this half of the formula, right? I'll take out the sum of the thing. Move this over too. And then here's the sum over C. Thank you. Okay, so and then of course if I now specialize to the holomorphic case, well this F here becomes another complex exponential, and this is really a Fourier series expansion. So if I write, um, Writing P M. Okay, so maybe I'll say so now we pick F. Z is the usual complex exponential. And if I write P M of Z in the Fourier series. Then I have that these Fourier coefficients are given by delta. Let me say, assume um, m is at least one. Delta m equals m plus the sum over Klusterman sums. Okay, and then here's imaginary part of W, the same integral. Okay, so actually this is if uh, n is greater than or equal to one because in the other case, if n is less than or equal to zero, the whole expression is just zero. So of course, I've assumed m is at least one, so this term always vanishes. And if n is strictly less than zero, actually this term goes to zero because I can just shift the contour up to infinity and this, uh, this integral ends up vanishing. So shift contour up. Okay, so that justifies my previous comment that the Fourier series really starts at, at one and the zero Fourier coefficient vanishes. Okay, so now having these two facts in our hand, we've actually computed the Fourier expansion explicitly and also knowing that the Poincare series is the thing that picks out Fourier coefficients from an inner product here. Um, because when I prove the Kuznetsov formula, I'll use exactly the same incomplete Poincaré series and it's exactly the same calculation that leads to the Kuznetsov formula. Yeah. So you said I have figured around the fact that something doesn't converge to either degree? Um, I don't think so. Okay. Uh, 
Sorry, what do you mean? Yeah, no, he's thinking of the case case question. Ah, okay. Because, uh, yeah, so it doesn't converge in, in the k equals two case, but um, Yeah, so, okay, well, as I just said, we'll take a different big F to prove the Kuznetsov formula. So here, the complex exponential is uh, it's holomorphic, but I'll take it to be an eigenfunction of the Laplacian, the big F to be an eigenfunction of the Laplacian instead, and then this will spit out exactly the Kuznetsov formula instead of the Peterson formula. So it's really sort of the same proof by just picking a different F. Yeah. So now, of course, the, the actual proof of the Peterson formula follows extremely quickly. Um, so I don't think the, the Poincaré series is going to converge absolutely if I Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Yeah, so certainly the Peterson formula converges wonderfully for k equals to two, as soon as I, as you say, have a non-trivial bound for the Klusterman sum, but maybe you have to play some slight other game with the test function f to wiggle around the fact that the fact the Poincaré series doesn't converge, so the, the proof doesn't literally work, but you can make it work by, as Frank said, kind of playing with the f. But yeah, I should emphasize that the Peterson formula works very well in the case k equals to two, and that's not a real limitation here. Okay, so maybe I'll say uh, proof of Peterson formula So we just compute, okay, uh, sorry. Let P, M, and Q, N, two Poincaré series. And so we're just going to compute uh, the inner product of P, M against Q, N in two ways. So the left-hand side of the Peterson formula will be we just expand uh, in a north normal basis. So we expand P, I guess. Yeah, P. So remember I wrote the orthonormal basis for S, K, Q, chi by B. Q chi, so then the P M Q N ends up being equal to, okay, so there's twice this constant that pops out. But really it's sum over the basis. Oh, I don't have to pull the constant out yet. It's just literally equal to the product of these two inner products. And then just applying the fact that these literally become the nth Fourier coefficient and the nth Fourier coefficient, you get the left-hand side of the formula. And then the right-hand side, we... Uh, we just use the explicit. So this is the nth Fourier coefficient of PM, which we just calculated over here. Because the inner product against uh, well, if I first expand. PM 
in this basis, I get sort of this with an F here. And then I just run the other inner product in because it's linear. And I get this. So, okay, QED. Given our computation of the Fourier expansion. So that's the Peterson formula, but we want to do the Kuznetsov formula because that's what's really going to be uh, useful for our arithmetic applications. So maybe I should call the, um, okay, so I'm gonna let delta be the hyperbolic Laplacian. Uh, this is the Laplacian. for h, and I'm going to let uh, a, s of, maybe I'll say, I'll abbreviate gamma not of q by just gamma. And so this is going to be the space of functions from the upper half plane to the complex numbers, uh, such that gamma, it's invariant by gamma, and also such that F is the, an eigenfunction of the Laplace operator. Okay, and then it actually turns out to be most natural to write this eigenvalue in the following way, but here S is just going to be some complex number. Okay, so that's a space of functions. Hmm? Yes? Yeah, yeah. So you won't actually use that term, you just don't put the k term in the cusp form, right? Yeah, Pn is actually a, is actually a cusp form. Okay. Yeah, because here, okay, so I'm cheating because I've only verified that it's a cusp form, it vanishes into the cusp at infinity, and I really should verify that it vanishes into the Fourier expansions of all the cusps. But here I showed that the nth Fourier coefficient was zero because I can shift this contour. So that's a cusp form. So I should say orthonormal basis of SKN. SK cube chi. Okay, so the Kunestov formula is a generalization of the Peterson formula for this space of functions. Um, Okay, so I'll also, in this case, so this is sort of um, weight k is zero here, and also trivial central character. Um, so there really are these eigenfunctions of the Laplacian of, of weight k equals one in non-trivial central characters, but we'll stick to these cases for today. Um, so in this case, we have the inner product. Which is the same as the inner product from before, just taking k equals to zero. It's the standard L2. Okay, I can't complex conjugate both of them.
Okay, so functions in this space also have Fourier expansions, okay, because any such f is periodic mod one, but it's a Fourier expansion of a slightly different shape than the standard Fourier expansion, because these functions are no longer holomorphic, but they're eigenfunctions of the Laplacian, so they're, of course, real analytic functions, but the fact that they're real analytic instead of holomorphic gives them a slightly different Fourier expansion. So um, I'll write it down explicitly. So I'm going to let f be in this uh, space of functions. And I also have to assume some very weak growth hypothesis on f. So such that f of i y is little o of e to the 2 pi y. OK, so it grows strictly smaller than that. Okay. Um, then there exists an A and a B, such that we have the following Fourier expansion. Um, oh, so maybe here I should say we, we often write uh, this S1 minus S in the following form. We could also write it as 1 quarter plus t squared for reasons that will become apparent uh, in, in the third lecture. Also, this is known as the, the eigenvalue of the form. So writing it compactly. Okay, so there's kind of three different notations for the, the spectral parameter. Sometimes we use an s and sometimes we use a t and sometimes we use a lambda, but that's sort of the translation between all the, the three different ways of keeping track of the spectral parameter. So I'll use that here. So that's what that T means and how it's related to the S. Okay, and, and, the, and the sequence, N, N. Okay, so now the Fourier expansion is in terms of this K Bessel function. So I don't want to kind of go into a long story about like what exactly this special function looks like, but suffice to say, we know everything we would like to know about it. It's completely explicit. There's dozens of uh, integral formulas for it, and it's something that's sort of very well understood. But the fact that I get this k-Bessel function and not a, an exponential is a reflection of the fact that it's a real analytic form and not a, not a holomorphic form. Okay, so I always have a Fourier expansion like this. Um, okay, and then I have my Poincaré series. So I'm going to take this incomplete Poincaré series with k equals to zero and chi trivial. And I'm gonna suppose now that uh, this f factors. So suppose there's some function p Maybe I'll write an imaginary part of z, e to n z. And we're actually going to pick p to be an eigenfunction of the Laplacian now instead of a holomorphic function. So pick p of y to be an eigenfunction of this Laplace operator. So there's, there's one eigenfunction of the Laplace operator, which is the easiest one to write down. Which is just y to the s power. So easiest choice. Uh, delta of y to the s comes out be an eigenfunction of the Laplace operator. So we'll actually write P uh, 
f m of z by p m z s with this choice. So explicitly, this is the sum over all the gammas in this quotient. Okay, so then all the previous calculations we did kind of go through directly. So we have exactly as before. We're going to have that the uh, inner product is going to pick out the Fourier coefficients. So I guess it's dot here. Okay, and so for this specific choice, I think we get some product of gamma functions, s minus a half plus it uh, gamma of s minus a half minus it. But what's really important is here the am Fourier coefficient given by this Fourier expansion at the top of the board. And because I worked this out for a general f before. This is exactly the same computation. So we also have, uh, we can also compute the Fourier expansions of these incomplete, uh, of these non-holomorphic Poincaré series. So we also have P M Z S is just E of M Z plus uh, a sum of Klusterman sums. integral transform. Okay, and then maybe I'll still put the, yeah, E of MZ. Okay. So we have both pieces, and so now we can, again, compute, compute this inner product, P M dot S, Q M dot S, in two ways. Uh, to prove the Kuznetsov formula. Okay, so there's this extra additional problem that this space that we're expanding in is no longer a finite dimensional space. It's this infinite dimensional space, so we can't just do finite linear algebra to expand the left-hand side in an orthonormal basis, but uh, there exists, there's, there's a spectral theorem for this space of, uh, of MOS forms, uh, and so we can actually make the whole thing still work even though it's an infinite dimensional space. So, I'll write the, uh, the results. Oh, I have another blackboard over here. Okay, so maybe I'll say um, let 
u1, u2, u3, etc. be an orthonormal, uh, a complete orthonormal set. For I'll say L zero to H mod gamma, so this is the, the cuspidal subspace. And I'll let E A of Z half plus I T be the Eisenstein series. at the cusp A. Um, of eigenvalue one quarter plus T squared. And then, uh, so I'm going to write rho j n for the Fourier coefficients. Of a uj, and then also, I guess, tau a n t for the same thing with this Eisenstein series. Okay, and then the theorem, so maybe I should say the Brueggemann Kuznetsov formula so I have um, I've kind of not talked about any of the test functions that go in here but this y to the s that we picked for the f also uh, that plays nicely with Mellon transforms and I can produce a wide variety of functions by playing games with the Mellon transform. So I'm going to let h of t be any function satisfying um, a couple properties, three properties, which I'll let to write. So uh, I'll ask that it be even. I'll ask that it be actually holomorphic in a horizontal strip. So in the imaginary part of T just being slightly bigger than with one half or radius one half. And then I'll also ask that it has enough decay to converge. So uh, H of T is bounded by something like one plus absolute value of T to the minus two plus delta, where delta is some fixed positive number. Okay, so then, finally, I can write the formula. And So again, I have this, here's the sum of Fourier coefficients. So here would be, this is over the, the cuspidal part of the spectrum against my test function, which I'm allowed to choose. Okay, so there's this hyperbolic cosine here. So there's a lot of uh, kind of details of like exactly what the size of these are, but this hyperbolic cosine kind of normalizes these in the spectral direction as J varies to be about constant size as J varies. So that's kind of the, the right normalization to make those pieces together be constant size as J varies. Uh, okay, so plus there's an Eisenstein series contribution. So this is the sum over the cusps.
And here we have the same thing, but with these Fourier coefficients of Eisenstein series. So these Fourier coefficients of Eisenstein series are typically, we, we like understand them. In the most classical situation, these are just divisor functions, and in general, they're gonna be some sort of modified divisor functions, but really they're sort of things that we understand a lot better than the Fourier coefficients of the cuspidal piece. So a lot of times you can deal with this by more bare hands techniques. Um, where, what do I have? Here's the test function again. Okay, so then this equals the delta function of m equals to n. Okay, so but it's normalized with some weight which depends on the test function h, of course. So, okay, some integral transform, and here it is, r h of r, hyperbolic tangent of pi r dr, okay, plus a sum of Klusterman sum. Okay, and then maybe I'll write g of four pi root mn over c, just like we had in the Peterson formula, uh, where g of x is going to be 2i pi integral j of 2i t x uh, t h t over chi pi t. Okay, so that's the Kuznetsov formula. Again, we have the same exact sums of uh, Klusterman sums coming up with here a different weight completely than we got in the Peterson formula, but it's, okay, it's an explicit integral transform. Um, so I'm just, I'm out of time for today, but the kind of sad thing is that this is not yet sufficient for our purposes for doing arithmetic applications. This is not kind of sufficient for Klustermania because this, um, this integral transform here is not actually dense on the space of the L2 space for the positive real line. So I can't actually represent any possible function with this integral transform. And really I want to be able to kind of take arbitrary smooth sums of Klusterman sums at the end of the day to, for the arithmetic applications. And I can't quite put an arbitrary test function in here yet. But it turns out putting this together, the only part of, the, of, of L2 of R plus that this integral transform misses is exactly what's given by the, the Peterson formula. And putting the two together will get nice expression. So I'll write that down first thing um, in the third lecture and then try to do some arithmetic applications.